What would you say is the most important verse in the Bible? Some of you, you've been coming to church for a long time, you know we're a big fan of an intimate personal relationship with Jesus, and you may have thought Psalm 23, that's a good answer, but it's the wrong one. Some of you, you've been going to church your whole life. You know the answer. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. It's a good one. You get two Jesus points for thinking about it. It's not the most important one. Some of you, you spend a lot of time in your New Testament and you're going, man, I think I'm gonna go with 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. That's a good one, one of my favorites but I don't think it's the most important one. Some of you, you've been going through a really tough time, challenging season. You stumbled across Romans 8.31, if God is for us, who can be against us? And you're getting ready to get that tattooed on your thigh. Pick a font, make it big, it's a good one. If you wanna do it in Greek or Hebrew, call me so that way you don't end up getting I like cats tattooed on you in a different language. Okay, for a small fee, I'll get you out of that bind. But that's not it either. I mean, you could go to the, the theological deep end, Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Do you know how long it would take to unpack that one? It's a great verse, an important verse, but I don't think it's the most important one. I want to propose to you that the most important verse in all of scripture is the very first one. Genesis chapter one, verse one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I wanna welcome all of you watching uh, online, those of you joining here at 48th Street and all of our other locations, those of you who are part of the Crossing Inside, I am so glad that we have an opportunity to spend some time together today. And whether you've been journeying in your faith your entire life or you're hanging out with us for the very first time, my hope is that at the end of this message, you will be closer to God than when you came in. Now, we're gonna get to our heart at the end of the message, but for a little while, can I spend a little time messing with your mind? Ready? It's interesting to me that the verse that I just read has become incredibly controversial. While the, we talk about God in our Pledge of Allegiance and it's still there, and if you pull out money, you'll see his name on our currency, and when presidents take office, raise the right hand, and they place their left hand on a Bible. After a tragedy, politicians will say, our thoughts and prayers. I always wanna ask, to who? Because a godless narrative has been pushed on us and our children. John Stewart, John Oliver, the crowd favorite, Bill Nye, the science guy, all push a narrative of life absent the presence of God. Whether you have Hulu, Netflix, Amazon Prime, YouTube, you sit down with your kids to watch a show about nature and to see how beautiful and complex the world is, and every single one of them presuppose a universe that was put into existence by mere chance. The summer of 2008, I was the campus pastor up in Macomb, and I had been invited by some people who were attending the church to hang out at their house while they had a party. This is not new to me, uh, and a lot of people who are in ministry, this happens, is when people start to get serious about their faith, they invite their uh, pastor over to hang out with all their non-Christian friends to kind of act as like a spiritual sniper. And, you know, they may pre-fill the, the, the bathtub just in case there's some baptisms after they, you know, hear my name, right? And so I'm there and I'm interacting with all the people that they've invited over to the house. And one of them is a professor from Western Illinois University. And we begin having a conversation and we're dialoguing. And in the middle of that conversation, uh, you know, he goes, so you mean to tell me that you believe in a talking snake? He's referencing Genesis chapter three. 
He goes, you're a smart guy, I can tell. I mean, you, you, you really, when you're gonna look me in the eye and tell me that you believe in a talking snake. Here's what I said. Yeah. Because if you believe the first verse in the Bible, you're not gonna have a hard time believing all the rest. We have been forced to believe that we have to make a choice between God and science. That we cannot have one, believe in one, without rejecting the other. However, some of the greatest scientific discoveries were made by men who had a deep and profound belief and love for God. Men like Albert Einstein, Blaise Pascal, Francis Bacon, Galileo, Isaac Newton, Louis Pasteur, and so many others. In fact, for years, scientific discovery wasn't just encouraged by the church, it was funded by the church. People who believed in God did not see science as the enemy to God, but as a way to understand him and know him better. That each scientific discovery allowed us to get a new glimpse into our creator. What we are facing is not God versus science. Faith versus smart people. Belief versus the ability to read and think. We've been conditioned to believe to the thinking God is small-minded and naive. When in reality, what we've actually been given a choice in is to believe in one of two religions. Not God and science, but one religion versus another. So let's look at the religion of evolution. I'm gonna walk through the different expressions of this religious belief. The first one is the religious belief in a cosmic evolution. And the God in cosmic evolution, in the religion of cosmic evolution, the God is time. If something doesn't make sense, just add more time, add another zero. So presently, the scientific community believes that the Earth is 14 billion years old. Plus or minus 40 million years. Now, the oldest document that we have for, uh, is from 3500 BC, or 3200 BC, making it about 5,000 years old. The plus or minus 40 million years, the give or take on the 14 billion, is 8,000 times longer than the oldest thing we have documented here on earth. If it doesn't make sense, just add another zero. Evolutionists worship the God of time. Christians, on the other hand, don't worship time. They worship God. While this may seem too simplified, Dr. Kent Hovind states that the beginning had to have time, space, and matter all come into existence at the exact same time. I'm gonna say that again. That time, space, and matter all had to come into existence at the exact same time. If they didn't, you would have a mess on your hands. Let me show you the mess. If you have time and matter, but you have no space, where would you put it? If you have space and matter, but no time, when would you put it? The Bible solves this in the first 10 words of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning is time. God created the heavens, that's space, and earth, that's matter. It gets deeper than that. 
We're going a fun little field trip. God is triune. You've heard us talk about the Trinity, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What you have here in creation is the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and the Spirit, who all participated in the creation, making in the first 10 words, a Trinity of Trinities appear. In the beginning, time, past, present, future. God created the heavens, length, depth, width, and the earth, matter, liquid, solid, gas. The Trinity make a trinity of trinities in the very first 10 words. Then you have the God of chemical evolution. How do we get all of the elements? How did these elements come into existence? An evolutionist will push the Big Bang. However, this creates at least two major issues at a very simplistic level. Reasonable questions that anyone should ask. The first one is, what banged? What banged? What was the thing that exploded? What was the outside force that created the explosion? What banged? And how could it be so big? You know what we call this? Those of you around here, this is our chicken or the egg problem. Did the elements cause the bang or did the bang cause the elements? And if the elements caused the bang, then that wasn't the beginning. What created the elements? Secondly, they're proposing that out of an explosion came unprecedented order. And if someone holds to this belief, tell that fellow to go home to his wife and use that same discipline for their house remodel. (laughs) Babe, you wanna do some, some new wallpaper? Or you wanna get rid of the wallpaper and we wanna paint new curtains, new trim? New flooring, new lighting, I love it. We're just a small stick of dynamite away from a brand new room. And after the explosion, you're gonna be tempted to think, this doesn't look right, but give it time. How come that doesn't make sense to anybody? But that is our solution that's pushed on us as scientific evidence for our existence. Science even admits that this is a theory that cannot be proven. Then you have planetary evolution, the religion of planetary evolution. This is the origin and the alignment of the planets and stars. Now, Earth, as it orbits the sun, is at a tilt of 23 degrees and it is rotating at a thousand miles an hour. If it only rotated at a hundred miles an hour, our day would be 10 times longer. The summer sun would burn up all vegetation on earth. The winter nights would be unbearably cold. For instance, the moon, It's a moon day or a lunar day is 15 earth days. And its temperatures range from a high of 214 above zero, which I've been told is hot, to negative 243 degrees below zero, which I'm guessing is quite cold. Or how about this one? If that's earth and for this sake, pretend that my head is the moon, averages about 240,000 miles away from earth. If it were only 50,000 miles, the gravitational pull would be so intense on our waters that twice a day, the entire face of the earth would be covered in water, which is one way to get your kids to take a bath, but it's a hard way to develop the necessary ecosystem for life. Or how about the atmosphere that covers our earth? It contains 21% oxygen. If it contained 50% oxygen, one lightning strike would cause a forest fire that would destroy all vegetation. If the oxygen level was only, was less than 10%, we'd have no fire at all. 
Or how about this one? When water uh, freezes, it expands while almost all other substances contract. That's why in the winter months, I look so skinny. In the summer months, I don't. It's because water is one of the few things that when it freezes, shrinks or expands. And when it does so, it becomes lighter than water. And so it sits on the surface. If it behaved the way almost every other element behaved, what you'd have happen in the winter months is that all the lakes and streams and ponds would start to form ice and it would sink and would push all of the life that's in the waters to the surface where they would die. Instead, the ice forms a barrier on the surface of the pond and lake, creating a thermal barrier allowing all of the water life to exist. Pretty unique. Almost seems planned for those of you who like shrimp catfish, bass, I don't know how you say it, crappy or crappy, depending on where you're from. There should have been an amen there. How about this one? The Northern Hemisphere is composed primarily of land mass, while the Southern Hemisphere is composed primarily of water. And land heats up more quickly than water does. And since we are always tilted this way, when Earth is in its orbit and it comes the closest point it is to the surface of the sun, guess what season that is for us in the Northern Hemisphere? Winter. And because we are t closest to the sun, but we are tilted away, the rays and the radiation that comes off of the sun, because they're so shallow, they skip off the surface and we experience winter. While the most intense part of the sun's rays land on the southern hemisphere, where all of the radiation is absorbed by the water and the vast oceans dissipate and moderate the temperature. If it was the exact opposite, the northern hemisphere would heat up in extreme ways. It's almost as if there was a plan about how we would sit in the solar system. Then you have the religion of organic evolution. This is, all of these is before we even get to the origin of life. But this is where you move from the periodic table to DNA. Strings of code in each and every single one of your cells the DNA in each one of your cells, if you were to stretch it out, would be six feet long from one end to the other. And this exists in every cell in your body. And if you were to pull out every cell in your body and lay out the DNA sequence end to end for just you, the resulting strand would be 67 billion miles long or the distance of 150,000 round trips to the moon and back. There is more coding in your pinky finger than in all of the iPhones ever created. Then you have macro evolution, the religion of macro evolution. This is the changing of one kind of planet or animal to another. This is where somehow uh, you move from rocks to cells living cells and you get a tree. And somehow out of that tree, it makes its way into an animal. And out of that animal, somehow it makes its way to you and to me. That there's a shift from inanimate objects to animate objects. From the roses in your landscaping it makes the shift to animals that can communicate with one another. And then somehow it makes its way from the animals to you and me where we experience and feel and have emotion. In the religion of macroevolution, you are no more valuable 
than the grass that you mow. You have no more significance than the bugs that you step on in your driveway, the spiders that you kill to protect your wife, and the animals that are killed underneath the magnifying glass of the summer sun and your boys. You cannot talk about human dignity. You cannot talk about love when you are no more valuable than the tree in your front yard. And then there's microevolution. Now, I don't like the word microevolution, but this is the only one that we've seen and observed and that you and I understand. This is how you get big people and little people. This is how you get lions and your house cat. This is how you got your golden doodle. The first five that I walked you through have never been seen. They've never been observed. They are religious beliefs that are taken by faith. There are many more we could go into. Uh, how about the one of an irreducibly complex system? An irreducibly complex system. This creates a huge problem for the evolutionary mindset. It's uh, an irreducibly complex system is the difference between a bike and a mousetrap. A bicycle, uh, you guys know what a bicycle is. Imagine that, that we're using that as a transportation device from point A to point B. And we have to ask ourselves, can we take anything off of the bike to, and it still perform its function? And the answer is yes. First thing we can take off the bike is the grandma basket that you have mounted on the front. Take that off, get rid of it, we don't need it. Can we still get from point A to point B? And the church said, yeah. And then we're going to take the bell off that your mom put on there because she wanted you to be able to warn everybody in case something bad happened. Can we take the bell off and it still get us from point A to point B? The answer is, yeah. How about this one? Could we take off the front tire? Yeah. We could learn to ride a wheelie. We could still get from point A to point B. It would still be a, uh, a device used for transportation. Could we take off the handlebars, the front fork, and the stem? The answer to that is, yeah, we could just ride it like a unicycle and still get from point A to point B. It could still perform its function, even though you have removed everything, a lot of the things away from it. But mousetraps? You can't take anything away from a mousetrap. A mousetrap is comprised of five things. In fact, every mousetrap that you've ever used has these five things. It has a platform that it all rests on. It has an arm that swings down. It has a locking mechanism to keep it from swinging down. It has a spring that allows the arm to move. And then it has a platform for the bait or a trigger. Now, if you take any of those things away, it ceases to be a mousetrap. Take away the spring and it's just a... Fancy mouse feeder. Take away the locking mechanism and it's a cussing device. <laughs> right? That's. Take away the bait station and it's just a torture device. You need all five of them in order for it to work, for it to function. Well, inside of large organisms are large organs and they are these biomolecular machines. At the cellular microscopic level, there's even more of these. And each one of these cells contains organs and components as well. One of them inside of your body is called the flagellum. It's what moves the cells around in your body like an outdoor motor. For those of you who spend any time at the Lake of the Ozarks, this is the outboard motor that allows you to get around on the lake. Well, this one propels your cells all throughout the body and it is comprised of 40 proteins and there are five components. The filament, the hook, the rod, the straighter, and the rotor. If you take any of these away, your cells don't move. You need all five of these to be in existence at the exact same time, fully formed in order for you to have life. A scientist made this discovery or statement. If it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not have the possible or had not have possibly formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would be abs would absolutely break down. In other words, if it could be discovered that in the human body there are irreducibly complex systems, my theory would not hold up. The person who said this? Charles Darwin. The amount of irreducibly complex system in your body 
lots. How about this one? We'll use another one that's an irreducibly complex system. Your eye. Your eye cannot work without the presence of an optic nerve. The eye will not provide lasting vision without some means to regulate the pressure in your eye. An eye without eyelids will not work for long. Our eyelids require continual washing and moisture. But unless there is an eye, what use is the duck that bring the tears and make the tears to the eye? Or the duck that uh, takes the tears away through a channel that passes through solid bone into our sinus cavity where the moisture dissipates as we breathe. Which led a scientist to make this statement. To suppose that the eye, with all of its inimitable contrivances or capable skills for adjusting the focus to different distances, for admitting different amounts of light, and for the correction of spherical and chromatic aberration, could have been formed by natural selection, seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest possible degree. This scientist after studying the eye, came to the conclusion that there is no way that this could have evolved over time. Uh, The person who made that statement said so in his book, Origin of Species, Charles Darwin. I concluded my conversation with the guy on the back porch. It takes a great deal of faith to believe in evolution. And I just don't have that much faith. We've been taught to believe that evolution is a solid foundation when it more closely resembles a block of Swiss cheese at a Republican gun range. At the very deep level, we understand that design demands a designer. Bob Russell says it this way, it's fairly simple. Every human instinctively knows the difference between random results and deliberate design. It's a matter of common sense. When explorers discover stick figures drawn on a cave wall, they speculate about the cave dwellers who inscribed those pictures on the wall. But no one ever suggests that perhaps a series of earthquakes millions of years ago caused those drawings to be made. They conclude someone has been there because people instinctively know the difference because you know the difference between deliberate design and random results. Or when tourists visit Stonehenge, the prehistoric monument in Wiltshire, England, no one suggests that a monument could be the result of a vicious tornado, millions of years of brutally cold winters. Anyone who sees these massive stones suspended in the air, arranged in a circle, instinctively conclude it was the result of intelligent design. Engineers speculate as to how these huge rocks could have been lifted into place without modern machinery. Wikipedia reads, archaeologists believe Stonehenge was built anywhere from 3000 to 2000 BC. Note they say it was built, not apparently evolved millions of years ago. Why? because we instinctively know the difference between deliberate design and random results. You mean to tell me that stacking stones on top of each other is evidence of design, but a cosmos held in balance. Your genetic coding, that was the result of an explosion. Test this theory out when you go home. Take this sermon to your driveway. Tonight, put a rock out in your driveway. Tomorrow, stack another one on top of it. The day after that, put a third one up there. And just start stacking stones. And pretty soon, your neighbors are going to be like, what are you doing? Yo, I'm not. It just keeps happening. They go, what do you mean? Well, every night, me and the missus let off a couple fireworks in the backyard. And a couple rocks show up in the driveway stacked on top of each other. They're going to look at you and go, you're an idiot. And you're going to go, you mean to tell me that stacked rocks don't just happen, but gravity 
and solar systems and emotions and biomolecular machines? They do? Okay. I eventually wanna do an entire sermon series on this with you all because I don't have time today to address the philosophical arguments, the moral arguments, the arguments from physics or even thermodynamics. The bottom line is, and I need you to hear me say this, you are not crazy to believe that God created the world. I could tell you story after story of esteemed scientists and foremost thinkers who came to a belief in God through the process of scientific exploration. What that means is, is that you and I, we have a great big God. Look what it says in Isaiah chapter 40. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance? We serve a big God. If one foot were to represent a million miles and we were to go to a baseball stadium and we were to put a basketball on home plate, that would be the sun. 93 feet from there would be another basketball, and that would be earth. And 484 feet in deep center field would be a ping pong ball, and that, that would be Jupiter. If we were to take that entire baseball field and we were to move it all the way to the west coast in New York City, and then we were to fly all the way to California, hop in a boat and go out into the Pacific Ocean, 4,880 miles from home plate, we would come upon another basketball. This would be Alpha Centauri, one of the nearest stars to our sun. 4,880 miles where one foot equals a million miles. The Bible is telling us that God is big enough to hold oceans in the palm of his hand. When you finish brushing your teeth and there's no uh, cup next nearby, you scoop your hand under the water and you pick up two or three ounces. When God scoops his hand in, Pacific, Atlantic, whatever the other ones are called. <laughs> When he measures galaxies, he uses his hands. Do you know what we use to measure our hands? Horses. You go and you talk to somebody, you're like, well, that's a nice horse. I'm like, oh yeah, that's a 14 hand horse. What they're saying is that horse is 14 hands tall. They might say 16, they might say 18, but if they say 20, they're lying to you because there's only been about one of those. God measures galaxies the way you and I measure horses. That's how big your God is. But even though your God is big, he's not too big. Look what it says in Luke chapter 12. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Uh, this was uh, before the COVID inflation, so I don't know what the actual price is on sparrows right now, but it's close. Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Ladies, take a deep breath. He only keeps track of the hairs on your head. He doesn't know what you're doing through the winter where you stop shaving your legs. He just keeps track of the ones on your head. And fellas, he's keeping track and he's encouraging some of you to grow a beard because the hairs on your head are, well, they're diminishing if you don't do something about it. He says, don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. You have a great big God, but a God who's not so big that he doesn't care about your little problems. What he's saying is you have a God who made you, created you, and will sustain you. You have value and you have purpose. You have a God whose hands are big enough to create galaxies. Well, that means that they're big enough to carry your problems, that you have a God who's so big that he can handle all of your problems, but his hands are tender enough to care about your problems. And how do you know he cares about your problems? Because his hands have two holes in them to remind you. You were made, and if you were made, you are loved. You're not crazy. 
You're just a child of God. We're moving to a time of decision.